Okay, so, how are you going everyone? I'm here at the Ipswich Nature Centre, which is a little wildlife reserve that the Ipswich City Council run. I'm here on a family visit, and I've been here before, it's a great place, and there's a big walk-in aviary, so I'll just uh, see what we can see bird-wise in here. Having a picnic with the family, and family little Torresian crows over here. Or two of them at least. You can see the juvenile on the left, which doesn't have the uh, light blue eyes. But anyway, this is going to be fun. So here we go. So we finished our picnic and the locals are already in to, to see what we've left behind. Um, now, I'm pretty sure all of these guys are Teresian crows. Um, we don't tend to get the Australian ravens here a little bit further west from Ipswich. Um, technically, uh, you could get them up around Toowoomba, but they tend to be just a little bit west of town. Now, telling ravens and crows apart uh, it depends on a lot of things. The ravens have bigger uh, throat hackles. They'll have a slightly larger, stouter beak and the feathers will extend down the front of it. The call for ravens, they really drown out the last... Arr, arr, arr. They really drown out the last one. <laughs> um, that one just crapped on the seat there. And um, I have heard that... Uh, in fact, you can see this one here doing it. That little guy's got a deformed beak, unfortunately. Um, but the uh, crows will hop and walk, whereas ravens will only walk. Now, I've been told that. Um, I'm yet to verify that with ravens, but I've certainly seen crows walking and hopping. But there's another way that you can tell as well. And if you look at this feather. Arr, so, um, this feather looks like it's from probably the breast or the belly. And you can see it's got a white base. So if you see a crow and if you catch it, uh, if you're not sure if it's a crow or a raven and you catch it uh, on a slightly windy day or if it's moving around enough, if you can see white at the base, as we can here, then that uh, is definitely a crow, whereas the ravens, it'll just be black. So anyway, it's a downy section there. Um, so anyway, these guys are obviously making a very good living here with all of the picnickers. So listen, and this is the one with the beak. Um, it's pretty sad given it's so young, he's in bad condition too, his feathers aren't very healthy. Um, but see, he's probably just eating scraps and not actually foraging as much as he should and wearing that beak down the way it should be worn down. So, you can see him hopping there too. So anyway, hopefully he can wear that down because I think he's having trouble closing his mouth there as well. But anyway, let's go in. Okay, so in this aviary here, there's rainbow lorikeets, which is kind of funny because they're everywhere. And we have these two red-tailed black cockatoos, and they were up the back before, but they've decided to come out. Let's have a look there. So that's the female on the left, um, just with the dots, and she has the lighter tail markings, and the male on the right. Very beautiful birds, very widespread throughout Australia. I can't remember how many subspecies there are, but the ones in Western Australia are a little bit different to the ones over on the eastern side. <laughs> They're just watching what I'm doing here. They're very beautiful, aren't they? And what would a wildlife reserve be without some Australian white ibis? Um, there's some here that are obviously not kept here, but they've certainly made use of it. There's a little colony on the other side where they're breeding, and all these ones down the front. I believe that the proliferation of white ibis around the country goes back to the Hillsville Sanctuary in Victoria. Uh, might have been the 1930s, I'm not sure. I haven't, I haven't looked this up, but they uh, were the first to... Um, 
Well, look, I don't know if, if the Ibis adopted the sanctuary or if the sanctuary had them, but that's pretty much where they became domesticated and realised that they could do well from people. Here we are, right up in Queensland, with them doing well in a uh, wildlife reserve here. So it's um, been a... Uh, I'm, a <laughs> I'm only in probably less than 100 metres, there's already been heaps to look at, so uh, it's a really nice place here. So this is a real treat, this is one of my favourite animals. They were hit really hard by cane toads and they're slowly coming back and they're turning up in some really amazing places, including in the Lockyer Valley. And I am talking about quolls, our largest mainland predator. And look at him. He was asleep before Neo was waking up. That is just so amazing. Fishing rod didn't go that. It's a carnivore. So it's the largest mainland predator. Okay, well, some of you might remember from the article I did a couple of weeks ago um, in the High Country Herald about wedge-tailed eagles and how they were indiscriminately shot, and sadly it still happens. Now, this um, bird behind us, which hopefully you can see on that angle, um, is a wedge-tailed eagle called Mary Jean, and there's a great display panel here about her. She was shot, that's her wing there, four times, and um, basically she's not able to fly properly or hunt or soar properly, but she did adapt well to, um, to being in captivity. So they've kept her here. She wouldn't survive if she was let out. But just looking at some of the information here, during the 1960s, 30,000 eagles were killed each year, um, which is just appalling. They're now protected all around the country, but there's still some idiots who shoot them, basically. <laughs> um, but it's just great that this one had the temperament to handle being here in captivity um, and that they've been able to look after her. She might come this way. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. She's gonna let's see what your flying's like. She looks like she wants to move. What a beautiful bird and the um, with the wedges, the females are bigger than the males, and I think that's true for all of our raptors, actually. Um, but yeah, it's just heartbreaking that an animal like that, which actually poses no threat to the sheep industry and serves a purpose by keeping down um, kangaroos and rabbits um, and even young dingoes. As an apex predator, they serve a really important role in helping create a good environment both the wildlife and even for farmers so the tide's turning there's not as many shot now but it's just tragic that some of them still do get that and the other thing they make a good point of here and look at it there with the bandaged up wing 
is um, because they're large birds, it's pretty hard for them to get going when they when they lift off. Um, and so if they're feeding on carrion beside the road, um, a good way to help them is by moving the dead animals further away from the edge of the road because they're less likely to fly in front of cars. But obviously only do that when it's safe to, um, to do it. Don't stop in a dangerous spot. Hello, Mary Jean. Look at me over here. <laughs> When she's looking directly at you, you really see both eyes and most predators will have two forward facing eyes because it helps with the binocular vision and the depth of perception and the ability to actually catch their prey. Whereas most birds that are omnivores or granivores or herbivores, fruitivores, anything that's not really hunting, they'll have their eyes more to the side of the head. So they've got uh, you know greater field of view looking out for predators like Mary Jean here. Okay, so this is pretty special down here. Um, let's go straight to it. These are Cape Barren geese, and the green area is actually their sear, which is the fleshy bit around the nostril. So that extends a long way down their beak. When I was a kid in Melbourne in the 70s, we lived there for five years, and that's when I was getting into birds, when I was probably about, oh, I don't know, eight or nine or ten or whatever, but these, um, these were one of the flagship species in Victoria for, because they were endangered then. They were one of the flagship conservation um, programs they had going or, you know, need to get going. And, you know, since we moved from Victoria, I haven't really thought about Cape Barren geese at all, but I was just reading a bit more about them. And they've actually recovered quite well. And the reason is that they've um, adapted to grazing in agricultural areas, which... Uh, is interesting, but um, they're not endangered now as they were uh, around southern Australia. So it's still really special to see them though. And one interesting adaption they have is they can drink fresh water or brackish water, so that's helped them uh, spread out on some of the islands through Bass Strait and around southern Australia. And I expect um, they'd have a gland near their eye to secrete the extra salt the same way that seabirds do. But I'm not quite sure they'll have to have some adaption to being able to um, drink the uh, the brackish water. But anyway, they're very beautiful birds and they're attracting a lot of attention here. I'm not going to feed you, is that what you're coming over here? They're attracting a lot of attention just because of their size. And I wouldn't mind betting in the early days of colonisation that they were hunted for feeding. What a lovely bird. All right, so here's the aviary. Um, I said it's mainly birds you get in the different habitat types around Ipswich. So we shall see. Well, um, this place is really awesome. Uh, it's just a great way to get really up close and look at birds. And I'll, um, uh, rather than kind of go through everything here, I'll just show you some of the highlights that I've got. But I mean, look at this white-headed pigeon. There we go, bunch of all the dove. There's heaps of them in here. Um, but look at this. So, it's just a great way to look at birds. There are a few um, uh, non natural mutations. I've seen a couple of blue princess parrots and some quarians or cockatiels with the wider um, wing patches, not true native colours. But none, nonetheless, it's fantastic. Um, Spoonbills, there's a pale headed rosella, uh, buff banded rails, um, lots of pigeons, which is interesting. Um, some glossy ibis. But yeah, it's just a great place to come and get a good look at birds. Obviously, these guys are all pretty used to people. So, anyway, he follows just a few little highlights. <laughs> Thank you.
Um, you got some princess parrots. That, uh, oh yeah, a lot of them here. That, um, bow bird was interesting though. He really didn't want the other birds close to his bow. So, you know, it raises the question of you're putting birds in an unnatural environment here. I, I do think it's worth it. I don't have a problem with that, but certainly the behaviour that you're going to get is going to be different. He's back there now. I love that um, anyway, unfortunately I've got to go, but we'll just come back here another time. Alright, so there we go. That was uh, a quick look and a bird-centric look at the little wildlife. It's Ipswich Nature Centre, it's the official name. Um, and well done Ipswich City Council. This place is brilliant. So I really enjoyed it. Make sure you come and visit Mozzie's coming out now. Uh, it's just been really good. So um, hope you enjoyed that. There's more to see in there than what I filmed. This is just what was, uh, you know, at the time and mainly birds. But yeah, it's just a really good place, especially for families. So there we go. Okay, hope you enjoyed the video. See you then. Bye.